All right, can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you for having me today, and thank you for coming out on a Friday morning um, to spend a little time with the Creative Mornings community and with me. Um, whenever Cody and Mary first approached me about talking about community a little bit, um, my initial thought was all these essentially stock images that go through your head, right? Like people holding hands in a circle, um, block parties, those sorts of things. Those initial thoughts you have with community. And really once I started thinking about it more and started to dig deep into what community really is, I started thinking about those deeper concepts of community. So what makes a community thrive? What makes it powerful? What makes it purposeful and strong? And of course, as part of that, I started thinking about Chattanooga and what brought my husband and I here in the first place. And so I'm sure many of you know this view. We were actually driving from Blacksburg, Virginia, where we lived at the time, down to Houston, Texas for a wedding. Um, kind of a far drive, but a beautiful drive. And we saw Chattanooga from the road. And it was gorgeous. And I remember stopping and saying, what, what, what's going on there? We have to go there. We have to see it. Um, and a couple months later, we ended up in Chattanooga, and it far exceeded our expectations. Um, I think beyond just seeing a beautiful view and being in the South with wonderful food, and particularly fried food, which is fantastic, um, we saw the spirit of community and these people that were solving problems in a really impactful way. They were ready to approach the problem. It wasn't necessarily, we have the perfect solution to this, but it was an idea of, we know that we can take a stab at this. This is something that we're passionate about, and by God, we're gonna try. And that was a really powerful thing about Chattanooga to us. So, I'm gonna take a step back, actually to 2012, and I graduated from Virginia Tech. I started working for a nonprofit organization uh, that focused on teen traffic safety. You can see some photos of us across the years. Lots of fun, but we were a super small staff of three people at our peak, we had a ton of wonderful volunteers that were willing to help and support us. Um, and it was just a, it was a wonderful, powerful organization. But we lacked a lot of things, as a lot of nonprofits do. And my duty while I was there was actually to plan out all of our statewide driving campaigns, which we had six to eight of those every single year. And I started really digging into the, the campaigns and looking at the materials, and I knew that to reach our younger audience, we couldn't continue with the design materials we had, we couldn't continue with the messaging we had, we had to rethink it and revamp it and think really critically. So I went to my boss and I said, okay, I'm gonna redesign everything. We're just gonna start from scratch and redesign everything. And she said, okay, well, do you know how to do that? And I said, well, no, like, why would I know how to do that? Uh, and so really across you know, the next couple months and years, I started really trying to hone in the skills of design. I knew I had visual taste, but I hadn't yet really studied and, and really learned what design was. And so I took classes, my husband would coach me, um, my boss was really wonderful to let me spend time on this. And from that, I really saw the power of good design, the impact it had, we were able to get more grant funding, we were able to increase our impact, increase engagement with students, they were excited to participate, they wanted to be part of it. Um, and we were ultimately able to save lives through that. And so that was a really powerful thing for me to see actually happening for a nonprofit organization. But as part of that, I also saw incredible difficulties that nonprofits face trying to be able to afford that work. To pay a staff member to spend time doing that, to hire somebody, was just, it was beyond what we could manage. And so seeing that, I started thinking critically of how do we make a change there? And so I was transitioning from my role at Yoviso to a marketing and design role at a technology company in Blacksburg. And I started talking to other individuals, other creatives and technologists in the area. And we started just discussing what we could do to contribute to our community in a better way. And they kept telling me, sure, we can volunteer at a food pantry and we love doing that, or uh, we can donate clothes, uh, we can donate other items, but we have these skills that we're really excited about, we're really proud of, and so how can we use those to really better our community and contribute to that greater good that we were discussing? And so after many conversations with those folks, uh, lots of conversations with my husband and some other designers in the area, we decided we were gonna find a way to bridge the gap between those two very separate worlds that truly needed one another. And that's really where Make a Mark was born. 
So this, uh, actually we held our first event in 2015 back in Virginia, and we served 12 nonprofits with different projects ranging from websites to branding and pretty much everything in between there. And it was an incredible experience um, to see people come together and dedicate an entire 12 hours to this, to this work that they really cared a lot about, both on the nonprofit side and the maker side. So quick summary of Make and Work. Uh, what we do is we pull together nonprofit organizations and teams of makers. And there's several makers in here that I can see already, which is really cool. Um, could you guys raise your hands, actually, if you were a maker last year or one this year? Nice. <laughs> Um, and so we pulled together teams of makers of three to four, uh, five or six individuals um, on different nonprofit projects. And we tackle branding and we tackle websites and we tackle video and photography. Um, and we really look at the nonprofits that apply. We look at their mission, their impact, the impact of the project itself, as well as the skills of the makers. And we really try to pair those people together to create a really meaningful experience. And over the past few years, we've really grown, which has been fantastic. You can see some of our events across the, the country and the globe now. So like Cody said, we're in 11 different cities. Uh, we're in San Francisco and New York. We're here in Chattanooga. We're in Charlotte, uh, Lexington. I'm definitely not going to hit them all. We're also in Brussels, which is our first global location, which is really exciting. Um, and as part of that, we've completed almost 100 projects. We've done uh, projects that are worth over a million dollars. So it's been an incredibly rewarding experience to be part of that and to be able to support the makers and the nonprofits that are participating um, and are sharing their skills and their time. But something I think that's even more meaningful than that, than just the day itself, is truly the spirit of community that forms as a part of that. So the makers and the nonprofits get to know one another. And I hope that if you do see some of these makers that have participated before, you talk to them about that. Because that is a huge piece of it to me, is a community, a brand new community that is forged that day and in advance. So we meet with the nonprofits before we get to know them. Uh, our makers meet with the nonprofits. And we really build a very strong bond that extends beyond just that day. And not only do the nonprofits get a broader understanding of design and technology for the humanitarian sector, they themselves shed a light on problems that we often don't understand. When we meet with these nonprofits for interviews, we get a whole new perspective of the work that they're doing and the problems that they're solving in our communities. And it's a really beautiful thing to see. Some of those problems are things we don't think about, like what happens whenever someone is facing a terminal illness and they're homeless. Where do they go? How do they get treatment? And actually, somebody right here in Chattanooga is addressing that issue. This is Sherry Campbell with Welcome Home of Chattanooga. She was one of the nonprofits last year and is participating again this year. And Sherry was a social worker in hospice care for many, many years. And she was hearing from individuals that they had seen people that were dying in the cars, on the street, under bridges, in this very city, with no home, no place to go, no shelter, no food, no support. And she kept hearing this year after year. And finally, she sat down with a group of people, and she said, OK, we have to do something about this problem. So she and a couple other individuals, they found a house, they rented it out, and now they provide shelter and food and healing and hope to these individuals that are facing these terminal illnesses here in Chattanooga. And they've been thriving for four years, and now they're actually buying the house that they've been renting for this entire time, which is a wonderful, beautiful thing to see. The very special individual. So I would love to actually um, talk a little bit more about that piece of it, um, about what the, the designers and the marketers and technologists are really able to do and embrace. Um, we, as those individuals, as those creatives, we. We are, it's our duty to support the nonprofits when we take them on. These people spend their days underpaid, understaffed, and underappreciated to do the work that helps our neighbors, our friends, and even those that go forgotten. These individuals work together to build a new community to create meaningful projects and support one another. It isn't about giving away free design and development labor all year. It's about working together in a controlled environment to create meaningful work, making sure that the makers and nonprofits feel appreciated and supported. It's about creating an equity of design for the nonprofit sector. 
I would love to actually show you a video from our New York City event that I think shows that collaboration between those individuals. Make a Mark is awesome because in one day you change 11 nonprofits' lives. You allowed us to communicate our messages visually. You empowered us on multiple mediums, gave us strength and courage. You allowed us to build our community beyond anybody that we have ever had access to before. We get to be heard and we get to make a big difference. And I don't think that we really appreciate how much visually we communicate and identify and let people know that they belong. And tonight, with all the products, you let all of us communicate to our people that they belong, that this is their space. And I'm so incredibly grateful. It's really important because there's so many companies starting today. And most of them are like, I make watches, I make clothes. There's no substance there at all. It's just something that's more creative. When then most of the time, the people that actually have something to design for, like that actually makes a difference, they don't have the money to hire us designers to do that. And it's just really awesome that we can dedicate a day to just do that for them and show them like how much that can change what they're doing. I love seeing the reaction of both of those parties at a Make a Mark event and seeing them really flourish and thrive together um, and seeing that emotional connection at the end, which is, it's really beyond what we expected when we started the event. We started the event to essentially provide work that could move organizations forward and also provide a really powerful outlet for these makers that we work with to contribute their skills in a way that they wanted to, in a way that was safe and supported um, by the organization. And so. Seeing that come together in that way was a fantastic, beautiful, I think, expression of what we were aiming for, but couldn't have produced that on our own without bringing those groups together, just like this special community here today. Um, something that's really cool about this and a long-held belief that I've had that was really enforced by Make a Mark, um, even more so, was that I truly believe that when people are educated on an issue, when they learn about it, when they get to care about it, when they have an opportunity to see people in that and build empathy around it, then they will act. And a lot of people think that that is a naive perspective, and I can certainly understand that, but I truly believe that that is the case for most people, that when people understand something or are educated, they want to act. And acting could be something large, like starting an organization or an entity like Sherry with Welcome Home, but it could also be something small, like showing more kindness and understanding towards somebody. So I'd love to talk a little bit about some of that different, those different forms of action that we've seen you know, across the country and globe and right here in Chattanooga. This is also a picture from last year's Make a Mark event here in Chattanooga, which was beautiful. And you can see the concentration and the activity and the excitement and the concern and the stress and every emotion that happens that day. And, uh, and it really is really a strong piece of that action. They're committing one day where they are fully focused and immersed with that nonprofit. And I think the wonderful thing that happens as part of this with the nonprofits and the makers is um, you know, these projects can take a long time outside of this 12-hour event. Um, you have these larger branding projects where you're really digging into something deep and you have to get to know the organization, or you're working on a website, which is not a small feat, and all these varieties of projects and topics, but they are so immersed in understanding of one another that the work that happens in 12 hours, the quality of that work is just what you would see in any situation over a six month, two year, however long branding process or website process, the work is just magnificent. Another example of action um, that actually comes from Make a Mark was this, this new event that we launched over the summer and it's actually uh, called the Global Awareness Challenge and truly is an opportunity for makers, not just in this community or in any of the communities that we're in, it could be all of the communities that we're in and beyond, are able to participate and really tackle an issue um, that is going to impact many nonprofits across the globe. So for this first topic, we actually chose food insecurity. We saw it as a problem in many of our communities here in Chattanooga and beyond, um, and even globally. And so we picked this issue, we researched it heavily, we talked to a panel of experts, and really got to know the problem and build resources around it. So a lot of different people across the globe, lots of different creators could come together and build things. 
And what the maker does is up to them. They can do anything from a microsite, a mini documentary, recipe cards to explain how to make simple things for people that are really struggling and don't have the time. Um, and they can submit that, and then we disperse that information to different nonprofits across, across the globe or just individuals that want to contribute in some capacity. So you could go and get those resources as well. And by participating, it's a long-term impact, but a very short period of time that you're committed to, very similarly to the makeathons. So this is one way that we really think more people can get engaged and build more of a community. About a year ago, I got acquainted with Portia at the Ink Line. And the Ink Line is a positive news organization. It's a, several journalists that were sitting down. They were sick of all the hate and conflict that they were reporting on and that they were hearing in the news and decided they wanted to create a, a medium and a channel for people to report out on positive work that was happening, positive social impact work that was happening across the globe. And this still remains a wonderful side gig for all of the journalists involved, but is a great way for them to be able to channel their skills in a meaningful way. And even just reading from the ink line, if you get an opportunity, really opens your eyes to lots of different possibilities and ways that you can contribute as well. And then the last little piece of action I would love to talk about is actually some individ an individual that's right here in Chattanooga, Wanjin Bagley. And Wanjin was driving her son to and from school every day, and she was seeing billboards around the city uh, that represented black men in an unrelatable way to her and to her son. And she was sick of seeing these images that were uh, not reflective of who her son was and who her son's friends were, and she wanted to change that. So she started a program called Bridge Scholars. It's a nonprofit organization. It's a summer enrichment program as well as a weekend enrichment program. They do five weeks in the summer, and then they do Saturdays, where they bring students from underrepresented areas to take classes like math and science and English and engineering and computer science, and they tackle those issues, as well as some recreational activities so they can get to know one another. And it really prepares them for these leadership roles in the community, as well as bridging that gap of academic success in the summer. You know, I think what we often hit and think about is we don't always know how we can engage. We don't always know if we can start a movement. I think we hit these barriers sometimes. It's great because we know we can contribute in some way, um, but we don't always think we can start that movement ourselves. And those barriers are natural, and there are a lot of barriers in the way, but most of those barriers tend to be psychological. We're constantly questioning our confidence. We're questioning ourselves. We're asking ourselves things like, who am I to tackle this issue? I'm not capable of doing this. Who is going to give me the money or the time to pursue the things that I'm passionate about? And who do we think we are to start addressing these things? But these questions are very naive, just as naive as some of the other thinking. And it's also toxic to our communities. The world needs our ideas and our innovation and our skills to be able to make something happen. We can't just sit down and hope that somebody else will solve the problems for us. We have to step up. We have to use our skills to face these issues that are occurring. And we have to do that with confidence and pride and really make something happen. We can't simply exist in a community and expect other people to do things for us. And I think the power is really in building new communities, forging our paths and forging our way, and building those communities where we see gaps. So I want to leave you with this. Where can you start today? Where do you see a problem or a gap or a missing connection? And where can you forge a beautiful, thriving community? Thank you.